Thanks for checking in with Down the Road Show. We're here at the Long Beach Comic Con 2011. Just like the guy in the booth next to me. <laughs> Just like Tom after an episode of Hung. I have someone else's notes up here. I'm happy to read them. They're kind of funny. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, Tom uh, will be here shortly, I imagine. Um, he doesn't have his phone's broken. Uh, to help moderate, but I've moderated a few of these myself, um, so it's not the first time I've been stuck doing that. Can you can you hear me without that? It seems kind of. Let me save the power. I was kind of hoping it was only about eight of you, and I was going to say, you know, just come down to the table and we'll chat. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, I think you know, I should have brought a program guide with me because I can't even really remember the title of the, the it's a quarter century of, it's hard to believe, it's hard to believe. How, ma how many people out here that uh, uh, have, have been, uh, have known of my work since I was doing role playing games? One? White Wolf? Yeah, White Wolf and, and that, that's kind of how I broke in was role playing games. Uh, and uh, I guess I should say before I get going too much, I'm, my name's Tim Bradstreet. You're here hopefully because you, you came to the right panel. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, I get, to, I get to do this crazy thing, um, like all those other freaks down there, probably some of you, um, and draw for a living, or write for a living, or that kind of crazy stuff. And uh, I feel very fortunate to be here. Um, so. Yeah, I started out in role-playing games um, and uh, kind of worked my way up, which was something I hardly recommend to, to people starting out. And I, I talked to a lot of you know young guys, young ladies. Yes. AB help? AB help? No. Are you gonna run video projection? No. I should have brought slides. We could have had a little slideshow presentation. Here we were at eight. I was eight here. This is my brother Bob. We used to draw pictures in the back of our car on vacation, copying from comic books. That's how I started. That's my sister, Trish. She used to be Patty, but she changed her name. I'm sorry. But, um, you know, I, I have an art book that came out a couple years ago called Archetype. It's a 20 year retrospective of, and, and in the beginning, in the front of that book, there's like, my, my editor asked me, or my publisher asked me, he said, This is a retrospective, so I kind of want you to tell, talk about how you got started and, you know, explain you know, what, how you got to here. And uh, so I say, you know, really, go read that. I'm kidding. But uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that says it better than I can say. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, God, you know, it's, it's kind of, I feel lame just up here. Hey, I started in, uh, but so I want to just open it to Q&A. I mean, and if, and if we run out, since we're only 45 minutes, if, if uh, we run out of things to talk about or, or we don't get through everything, then yeah, come back down to the table and we'll, we'll shoot the breeze. I'll tell you some really horrible stories that I won't repeat in front of video. Uh, it's the unexpurgated version of this panel. Uh, so does anyone have, I'm sorry, uh, does anyone have any questions to start off with? Yeah, how did you get a Bob to work here with Thomas J? Tom and I uh, met on The Punisher, and uh, that's, a, that's a, actually a pretty funny story. Um, it, you know, there's, there's pinch yourself 
pinch yourself moments. And uh, one of those pinch, pinch yourself moments for me was uh, first when I got asked to draw Hellblazer monthly. Um, and the second time, or this is probably the 40th time, you know, since I started, I, because I, I, I used to be on that side of the table for a long time, and to get to be a professional is pretty, like pretty cool. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's the room. Hey, sorry I'm late, guy. And so, so Tom and I, to, to kind of skip ahead a little bit, uh, I, got, I got working on The Punisher, I, I can't even remember what year it was, 96, 97, and, uh, and that's how I met Tom when they were casting for the film. And uh, pri prior to Tom even being, no, it was right around the time Tom got cast, I found out they were making a Punisher movie. And so I emailed my friend, the only person I knew who could, like I found out Gail Ann Hurd was producing. And so I, I got a hold of the only friend I had that I knew could get me in touch with Gail Ann Hurd, and that was Frank Darabont. And I sent him an email and I said, Frank, you know, I do this Punisher book, they're making a movie, Gail Ann Hurd's producing it, is there any way you can get me her office number? Um, I want to try to work on that film. And he sent me an email back and he said, I'll, I'll, I'll do, do you better than that. He goes, Gail's a dear friend of mine and her husband, Jonathan, is the director of the movie. So he sent them an email along with his recommendation and I, and I got a call the next day from Jonathan and started talking to him on the phone and uh, talking about the movie and talking about every, you know, basically talking about all the ins and outs of what this movie was going to look like, and he wanted to know what I thought of the script and blah blah blah. It was really great, you know. We we had a wonderful little, you know, discussion. We had we had a lot of talks about it, you know, and I I gave him the idea for the trailer he shot and blah blah blah. And uh, that eventually turned into uh, the movie getting made and and. Uh, me meeting Tom to do uh, movie posters. And we, we were here in San Diego, well, I say here in San Diego, we were in San Diego one night um, while he was doing promotion for, for, the, for the film prior to its release. And we met at a hotel and, well, we did a comic store signing. We met doing the photo shoot. Well, we met doing the photo shoot, yeah. For the, for the movie posters. But I was, I was a, how did we get, because I remember saying you gotta get Tim Bradstreet to do the, to do the photo. I mean, to do a, a, we were just going to do a Comic-Con exclusive poster. It's like, we've got to do, get somebody to illustrate the poster. The guy who does the covers for the Punisher, we should get that guy to do a limited edition poster for Comic-Con with, with me as the Punisher. And that's how that got set up. Yeah, doing like the idea was, well, originally, uh, Jonathan wanted me to work on the film. And then when they got greenlit and got into pre-production, he called and said, Tim, I'm really, really sorry. They don't want to hire you. And I went, what? And he's like, I fought for you. I want you on this movie. They don't want to hire you. And I said, why not? And he goes, well, they say, they all have all these covers. What do they need to pay you for? And I was like, you're kidding me. And, and uh, he said, no, I mean, that, that they, and I go, because we've been talking about everything but what the Punisher was going to look like, you know, what, I mean, that was a given. Um, so I called Ari Arad and I said, uh, Ari, you know, uh, and I explained to him what Jonathan and I had been talking about and, and all that, and, uh, and he just, he wasn't, you know, he was like, sorry, man, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're doing something else. And I was like, okay, I said, but, you know, hey, before I let you go, I got a really, I got a cool idea. You know what you should, we should at least do is, you should have me do a teaser poster of, of Tom as the Punisher, like I do the comic book covers. It'd be a great bridge for the comic people to get to the movie. You know, they recognize my stuff and they identify it with that and so on and so forth. And he goes, huh. And so that was that. Cool. And about two months later, he called me on the phone and he said, Tim, uh, Ari, uh, I got a great idea. We want you to do a teaser poster <laughs> for the Punisher. And I said, you have a great idea. Don't you remember the conversation? I mean, I called him out on it. He was like, oh, yeah, 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 well, yeah. Well, it seems someone else had that idea, too, and that was Tom. And I didn't know it at the time, uh, that Tom was championing for me on the other side. But um, Interesting. It's really funny. At some point, somebody was going to get a fucking poster out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that one poster turned into five teasers, thanks to Eric Lieb's ingenuity at Lionsgate. And yep. then um, 
those 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 pieces. Tom, I guess, was they were doing they were getting ready to ramp up all the marketing on the movie, and Tom was in a big meeting where they brought in here are the movie posters, and what happened in that meeting? Um, <laughs> well, we had all the photo mock-ups of John Travolta and myself, and they were all, you know, the typical terrible. 80s poster that you <laughs> imagine with two two big heads. They were like made for TV movie posters, yeah. you know. As my character says in the mist, you know, two big heads. <laughs> and uh, and we all hated them. I mean, everybody hated them. I hated them vehemently. Um, and then at some point, you know, I mean, I wasn't the only one saying this, but it was like the posters that Tim Bradstreet did are a hundred times better than this bullshit. <laughs> um, and then so that led to, uh, I guess, you doing even a, another... Well, yeah, I mean, Thompson, so why, why isn't Bradstreet doing the theatrical poster? So, so then we got, we got Tim to do the theatrical poster, which was great. A little more photographic, but it was at least Tim's design and... And, uh, and they looked hard, and they felt like, yeah. Yeah, and it looked a hell of a lot better, you know. It was funny, too, because... Uh, but, you know, I, my, my the whole time we were making the Punisher movie, I kept dragging out Tim's work all over, the, all the time, and trying to really just pummel Jonathan Hensley and the cinematographer with what this movie wanted to be and what it wanted to look like. And, uh, and, it, and it was Tim's... Uh, uh, covers that made that got me excited about doing the movie in the first place because I didn't like the script and I didn't like the idea um, and the costume. But I loved. Uh, I love. I said, but if we can do a movie about that guy, you know, uh, then then we could really have something. And and I I fought a lot of battles and won a few uh, to make the movie more like Tim's uh, poster. But I but I lost I lost a lot of battles too and, and that you know so we ended up shooting in Florida and it, it ended up with, <laughs> being a, you know it's like it's a it's a double edged sword I guess is so that was the, but I can tell you when we first met to do our our poster together and you were the guy that I, I think I told you like it's because of your work that I even signed on to this thing yeah. We just kind of started a conversation that's still going on today. Well, we yeah we hit it off, and I, I brought him one of my my first my first art book, Maximum Black. I brought him a copy of that, and he was flipping through it and telling me he's a big comic fan. When he, you know, he's been reading comics since he was a kid and big collector, and and, and uh, he's flipping through my book and he gets to the Crow City. Of, I did some some, uh, some some covers for the Crow City of Angel uh, comic adaptation, and Tom goes, "Hey, that's me." You know, and he's like, and I'd drawn Tom before, I didn't even know it, because yeah. Tom was, you know, he's a member of Iggy Pop's little crew yeah. in City of Angels. Yeah. What was your character's name? God, I got Nemo? Nemo. Is that right? The, video, the guy out with the video camera. <laughs> we stuck a cool picture of you from that up on the website not too long ago. I, I, un, I unearthed some, because when I was working with on The Crow to begin with, um, so I've been friends with James O'Barr since I... Pfft, broke into the business like a long time ago. And uh, it was before, you know, the Crow movie and, you know, Jim was just Jim. And uh, James, uh, uh, I always call him Jim. And, uh, and yeah, when I worked on the films Pressman, um, they always sent me a ton of reference and I just unearthed this like photo reference that they'd sent me. Like it's been like sitting in my garage for 15 years. And I found these really wonderful shots and I, I scanned them and sent, sent them over to Tom. Pretty cool stuff. How did you meet all those guys? Uh, did you guys, did you already go through the, how you sort of went from the, the guy carrying the portfolio to guys carrying their portfolio up to you? And, and no, seems, no, seems not like really. I, I, I referred them to go buy my ar architect. No, not to, not to buy it. <laughs> Actually, just, just go swipe one. Uh, no, no, I didn't really cover that, but uh, I mean, I, I did say, and I have kind of mentioned that I, I was on, on the other side of the table for a long time, a fan uh, of comics. Of so would you go to conventions oh, as yeah. a fan? Yeah, yeah. Did you definitely. have a portfolio? Yeah. 
and you'd walk around to, mm -hmm. to tables and meet artists that you admire. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And and, you know, terrified to meet some of them, and you know, yeah. you know how it is, right? Oh yeah, sure. And, and uh, you know, it's like meeting the legends, you know, and uh, it's it's like meeting Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio, and for for me, for for my generation, or for you know, I wasn't really as into baseball, but it's the same kind of it's a good sure. analogy. Sure. Who who were those? Uh, Joe Kuber, Jim Steranko, um, Tim Truman, uh, well, I never, Frazetta, but he, not like he ever set up at shows, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, Bill Stout. Uh, Those are some of the guys that you actually met as, yeah. as a guy, and would they look at your work? Yeah, wow. Gil Kane, and, you know, like. I was my first show was in 1983, and my dad took me up to Chicago Comic Con, and, and and I walk up in the Continental Congress Hotel downtown, up into this like it's a big horseshoe shaped you know like room, and you look down and there's the hotel down there, but this big horseshoe shaped space, which was the the where the aisles were about you know going around this horseshoe, were about as wide as this room. Gil Kane. Uh, John Buscema, Arnie Chan, Marshall Rogers, uh, Joe Staten, Bill Sienkiewicz, uh, Tim Truman, uh, Howard Chaikin, and, and I'm just, <laughs> oh my God, you know, I'm like, a long way from the kid, the, you know, the, this eight-year-old kid that thought Stan Lee wrote and drew everything. <laughs> but, uh, but so it was, it was amazing. Uh, I mean, I was on cloud nine. It's like, it's like, it's like walking on a movie set with, uh, with, with, you know, John Wayne standing there, you know, or, you know, anything, I mean, you use any analogy, but, um, yeah, it was like I was in the Hall of Legends. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So, and I would take my stuff around and show, you know, I would sometimes, sh I, I remember I showed Bill Sienkiewicz my work at that show, and he was extremely, um, you know, I was just a 15-year-old kid with, you 15. know. 15? Yeah. Wow. <coughs> you, and you have a portfolio that you're showing people? Yeah, I had comic page, I'd drawn these comic pages, which were, you know, some of them were swipes, you know, and I didn't sure. know what I was doing back then. Yeah. I just loved comics and I loved the art form, and, yeah. I, I, you know, I did everything with a tech pen. You know, this is what you do when, you're, when you have no fucking clue. And, um, and so, you know, the, the thing about going to shows and meeting the artists is not only do you get to see their original work, and you go, oh my God, you know, how do you get, how, do you, how, how will I ever get that good, that proficient, you know, and like, it's like, it's, it's, it's mind boggling when you're, when you, when you have no, when you walk in with no clue. And uh, then, you know, hopefully the good ones also give you advice and they go, hey, you know, they critique or they, you know, bless people that take the time, you know what I mean? For a young guy, hey, do you, you mind, and it's hard for someone to say, hey, do you mind looking at my stuff and telling me what you think? Especially when that guy's there to, you know, sign autographs and hey, maybe I can sell some stuff. Oh no, let me let me take forty-five minutes and look at your work. No, I mean that's that, I mean that's some people the way they think about it. I mean John Byrne was my favorite artist when I was you know in my teens, and he's a complete asshole. I mean he is he is dare I say a douchebag. Um, Why is that? He's just mean. <laughs> he's, Maybe he, just he doesn't get give. He, he, well. he doesn't. He doesn't. I don't think he gives a rat's ass about the fans. He does what he wants, and he's, uh, right. you know, he's just he's arrogant and self-centered. And I'm sure he's a nice guy to the people that love him. Um, but he he doesn't have time for people like us, and that's fine, I guess now. But <laughs> at the time, it broke my heart. Aww. But then, you know, for every John Byrne, there's a Walt Simonson. And, or a Ron Wilson, who, you know, I was, uh, Ron Wilson was this guy who, who, you know, he wasn't, you know, one of the top favorite artists. He wasn't Neil Adams. He wasn't, you know, Jim Starlin. He was just a kind of a journeyman artist. Very good. He hit his deadlines. He always turned his stuff in on time. He did solid stuff. And I wasn't necessarily a big fan of his work, but he was sitting there when I showed my work to John Byrne the first time. And John did this. <sighs> nice. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I mean, I stood in line for three hours to get nice. I mean, and he wasn't reviewing people's work necessarily. He was trying to sell pages, and he was signing autographs. And uh, but I was just like, you know, absolutely crestfallen, crushed, all that. And Ron Wilson saw that, and he went, "Can I see that?" 
And then he sat there and he looked through every page and he broke it down and he critiqued my work and he was, I, I was his biggest fan after that day. <laughs> and um, so yeah, I mean, so that, that was kind of like, you know, I was I think 14 at that, that show. That was actually the first show I went to. The, the, one, the Congress with the Horseshoe and Gil Kane and all those guys was actually my second show. But um, and what about uh, Tim Truman? How, how did you meet him? And, and he, you said that he's kind of like your you're his protege. You you really have a connection with him yeah. and his work. And I tried to emulate his work a lot, um, but it was when I found my own voice right. that I went to a show and I just had just done this game called Vampire. Um, and my my work in the last year and a half had really I, I kind of something clicked, and I figured it out. How old were you? Around 1990, so I was uh, 23, cool. and I'd been working in games since I got out of high school. So it was like that was my training ground. But um, I went to see Tim Truman every year at Chicago Con. I show him my work. I buy stuff from him. I mean, because I was like, you know, Tim, so, you know, I could afford his stuff. Um, I had a job, and so I bought pages. And one time he gave me it's like this unpublished story, Dog Soldier. Uh, and it's like it was this, it was a rarity. Truman's dog soldier. He gave me the pages. Wow. I was at a show with him in Minnesota. It was it was it was after I knew him and after we worked together. And he said, I want you to have these. So, yeah, I I don't really care too much about it anymore. It kind of hurts because it was a thing he did with Chuck Dixon. And he, and he said, and the guy that should have these is you. And he gave them to me. Wow. So, but so yeah, so you met him at a Chicago show. And you'd already admired his work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he, was he and how scout, did, did you show jack. did you show him your portfolio? I showed him my work every year, and he always was very generous and very nice. And I'd I'd hang around his table like most of the weekend. I'd just be you know after I got done talking with him, I'd be over here, I'd be looking at his pages, and I'd be just listening to what he and Chuck Dixon and like Tim always traveled with a posse: Bo Smith, uh, Gary Quapitz, Graham Nolan. Um, because Tim was a guy who was kind of like, he'd take guys under his wing and he'd collect them. And, but it wasn't like he was taking advantage of them. He was giving them their opportunities and their starts. Right. And um, you know, he and Chuck Dixon started this line of comics through Eclipse called Four Winds. Um, and you know, they brought all these guys they met at shows that they'd become friends with, that they'd taken under their wings, and they gave them all work with new titles that they'd thought up and created the Prowler and Fashion in Action with John K. Snyder and like all this cool stuff. Um, That's cool. But yeah, what that, so, the, so the one year I went up to him after I'd done Vampire and I was showing him my work and he was just going, God damn, you know, he was starting to do that kind of stuff. And, and he said, you want to work on something together? And I was like, <laughs> talking to me? And he's like, yeah, do you, do I, you know, I got this thing called Dragon Chang. It's crazy, you know, Tim's, Tim's West Virginia, you know, like Pennsylvania guy. He's like, yeah, it's, it's about this Chinese communist truck driver. And, he, and I'm like, I'm, and he drives this truck. He drives this big old truck, and it's kind of a post-apocalyptic thing. And the truck's like the cockpit of a Russian Hind D helicopter. And I go, well, fucking cool, you know? I was like, yeah. Well, and I mean, I walked away from that show like, like absolutely on cloud nine, and then and then my dad, my dad always loved. He he always loved to say, "You should have seen in your face the day that the I got this package from Tim in the mail, and and this is what made it reality. It was the first seven pages of Dragon Chang, and he wanted me to ink them, and he did it on this duo shade board, which is a they used to call it craft tint back in the days of EC and stuff like that. A lot of guys use this stuff, and and it's a paper that has a uh, lines embedded into the paper and then you take a light developer it's just like a clear liquid and you brush it on and these it's like zipatone it's like liquid zipatones um so what happens you, you, so you get shading yeah you get it's the paper and it's and it has a, a light tone and a dark tone which is the line the lines again embedded into the paper going the opposite way in a cross okay and so you take the light developer and you brush it on and it brings up only the one lines whoa you take the dark developer and it brings up the other Both one. lines. So you could do one or the other. One or the other. So you got shading. two tones and then black. So, so you could do, do half shade. tones on one piece of paper. Yeah. That's like a really neat piece of paper. Freaking amazing. <laughs> and uh, I'll show you a sample when we go downstairs. Do we ever see this? It's, you can still find it, but it's, it's hard to find. Really? Yeah. They still make the shit? 
Ohio Graphics still makes it. No kidding. Yeah. And why don't comic book artists use that anymore? It's expensive. Um, it's probably you know ten, 10 bucks for a sheet of this stuff, and the sheets are kind of small. You can get maybe maybe three pages out of a sheet. Right, that's one reason. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then, and then no one knows it's there anymore, and now there's a computer, so they can just like fake it. You know, they can they can like you know come up with any texture they want and throw it down. So don't they don't know, have but, to. But but the guys who are still drawing on. On boards. Yeah, I don't know. They, I, I, they, it goes, they, they'll be filling that shit in themselves. There They're was a resurgence of it in the, in the uh, I want to say mid, you, what, what year was it when Dark Horse was doing the first, remember when Mark Nelson did Aliens yeah. for Dark Horse? And he did it on that duo shape paper, the craft tip board. Yeah, like 88. Was, was it 88? So there's a brief resurgence. Then. So Mark, and that when people saw that, oh, what is that? You know, and like people started using it again. Mark Nelson kind of started. Over. Well, it might have been knowing Mark, it was someone turned him onto it. I think it's time to bring that shit back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm the light. Would it be, it would be good. Uh, no, or would it be messy? Uh, it would be weird. Hard to say. Well, you know, there's different surfaces too. There's meso tint, light and dark. There's a line. There's just like four or five different kinds of it, but it. the uh, um, so you got a package in the mail from Jim Truman with seven pages of duo shade mm -hmm. of Dragon Chang drawn on duo shade board, and he wanted me to ink it, and and I was so daunted by by touching Tim Truman's pencils that I light boxed them, redrew them on other paper, and started them. inking that. That was fun because I didn't want to ruin them. Fuck it up. But I knew I was going to have to go back and do those pages because they were on duo shape boards. Doing and a I can't. Doing a little practice run. Yeah. Did shape. a practice That's run. Smart. So I got about four pages where I found my confidence. Right. And, um, and then I finally felt like I could slap ink to his work. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, I overworked the shit out of those pages. But <laughs> yeah. I sent it in, and Tim, Tim had been drawing looser and looser, I guess, or, or, you know, over the years since, he'd, and since he'd, his first work on Grimjack, when he used to put all this detail and all this stuff in. Well, Tim figured out the reality of comics is there's these things called deadlines. And, uh, <laughs> and it limits the amount of that work and that passion that you could put into every page when you have to meet those deadlines sometimes. So Tim's work was kind of getting looser and looser. And when I ate Dragon Chang, of course, I was on fire, man. I was passionate. I was like, man. And like, so the people around him, like Bo Smith, were saying, oh, they were seeing the pages and they were going, oh my God, you know, Truman hasn't looked this good in like 10 years. So even though I was, you know, kind of worried about how much, you know, and, and, and I look back and I know it was overworked, but at the time, um, I was just, you know, the only, the only, I just wanted to please Tim. That was my only, the only thought in my, in my head. Awesome. And then and, and, and Tim he was, was pleased. Tim was yeah. And then I did a couple of illustrations. I was so inspired by the story and this character that I I just for the hell of it did up a couple of illustrations and I sent them to Tim and I said you you know maybe we can use these for you know in the books or advertising or whatever or you can throw them away and Tim's like uh, this is amazing. He's like I I, I want to buy this. No. I mean, he, he, I, I, I tried to give them to him. I was like, no, you take them. He goes, no. And he paid me like a grand for these, for this illustration. Wow. It's still in his collection, I assume. But he, I mean, he was just like, he was, he called me and he was like, Tim, my God, this is, this is Jesus. What the, when did you, you know, and he's like, and, and so that was like this ultimate kind of like, I felt accepted, you know. Yeah. I used to follow Tim. Truman. This is kind of a fun stalker story, but <laughs> I, I, you know, I would see Tim and I'd see him with his fans and I'd see him with his group, and I'd just be like, he was like a rock star, you know. He was like this. I, I was just like amazed by him, you know, this friendly, gregarious, warm, strong, you know, wonderful guy, and uh, and they'd leave the show, and I'd be like. And then there'd be a party that I wasn't invited to, you know, because I wasn't, you know, in the business yet. And but I, I, I kind of follow those guys and kind of see what they were doing, you know, the posse, you know. So I kind of stalked the posse, which if you want to switch a vowel on, I did some of that too. But um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was amazing because, yeah, I mean, I remember that same show that I got asked to work with Tim. Bernie was there with Batman the Cult or something like that. And I met Bernie for the first time at that show. 
It's a pretty cool show. Hmm. What yeah. show is this? This is a Chicago Comic Con. Yeah, okay. Which you were at every year. 1990, 1991, something yeah. like that. That's really cool. And ha so your work, you, you were doing uh, original stuff, uh, but did you get a, ever get into getting paid for sequential work, or did you just, what happened at that point in your career, 23, 24, you, you found, you really started to find a voice. Uh, where did you take it? Because you were working for a video game, weren't you? No, not not no no. I was I was working for role playing games. Um, role -playing. And I was making most of my living working in games, pen and, pen and paper uh, role playing games. And um, so I was moonlighting in comics, trying to break in and do more work. But yeah. Tim introduced me to Eclipse Comics, and and they saw Dragon Chang, and they said, "What else do you have?" And I showed them my illustrations, my vampire stuff, and they went, "Oh my God, we want you to do a Clive Barker adaptation." Cool. And I was like. I'll do a Clive Barker adaptation. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, we want you to do this book, Age of Desire. And we don't know, you know, we don't know you very well, but it's a little weird. And, and, it, and it is. It's a Clive book. Yeah. But, it's, uh, it, but it's got some sexual, it's about this guy who they turn into a, a, a scientific experiment that he's a walking aphrodisiac. And, and it, it's, it's, it's pretty twisted stuff. But I was like, yeah, well, it sounds really cool. And they said, well, yeah, Craig Russell, P. Craig Russell's doing the adaptation. I'm going to work with P. Craig Russell. What did he create again? I, I remember seeing his name on some, some fairies and you know, all stories. Uh, fairy tales Elric. of Oscar Wilde. Um, but, but what, yeah, what, what Craig was really famous for was Kill Raven, War of the Worlds, um, you know, for Marvel, and, and um, Elric with Michael Moorcock for, like, Epic and, yeah. yeah. He was yeah. one of my heroes. Yeah, yeah, he was cool. And, and I didn't know this at the time, but the reason they even hired me for the job is that they fired Craig <laughs> from the job. <coughs> wow. His style was getting kind of cartoony, and uh, they decided that wasn't the look they wanted for the book. But he stayed on it, because Craig's a great guy, and um, he, he did, basically, he thumbnailed all the pages. So it was like stick figures and balloon heads, but it was all all the panels and all the page storytelling was like Craig, uniquely. I mean, you've seen Craig, if, if you're familiar with Craig Russell's work, his work is one of a kind. Um, if you see, I mean, so even my, you know, the way I, even if it was my art, you could feel Craig Russell all over it. And because I drew photo real and I kind of had a similar sensibility to Craig to begin with, he really loved what I was doing with it too. So it was, it was kind of a match made in heaven. But during the journey of making this thing, because I'd only ever shot, hey, my friends, come on over. You know, I'm doing photo real kind of illustration. But, and for games and stuff like that. But I mean, now we're talking about a 48 page, you know, and with Craig Russell, anywhere from seven to 17 panels on a page. Oh. Where I have to, basically stage all that. Yeah. So I'd, I'd, I'd get scenes, I'd cast it, I'd costume it, I'd find locations, and I'd get my friends, and then I'd, I'd, we'd, we'd, I'd block it out and we'd shoot it. All right, so how did you get started in this style where you, where you decided instead of sitting down with your, well, you know, all artists use references, so they've got their little wooden dude that they <laughs> <pose>. <laughs> I never used reference. Got, well, you know what I mean. They no, I mean before what? before the photos, before I had kind of switched into photos, right. I was totally from the head to the paper. Uh -huh. And I right. worked in games for three years like that. And then they, I got, and this is how it happened. I, I got offered to do this game called Chatterer. And they already had some artwork by this guy named Alex Ross. <laughs> and they also had some artwork by this guy named Mark Nelson, who we talked about a few minutes ago with Aliens. And they said, it kind of looks like this. Now, they showed me Alex's stuff. Now, what Alex had done, and this is way before Alex, yeah, anyone knew who Alex Ross was, they were illustrations on Duo Shape Board, but they were all swipes from lobby cards. This one was from Time Bandits. He just changed a face, and he moves some stuff around. And it, so it looks like David Warner, but he's not wearing the evil horns, and, and he turned it into a cyber. cyber Who's culture. doing this? I'm Alex sorry. Ross. Alex Ross is doing it. Then this, and then this one is a lobby card swipe from Blade Runner. And he just gave Rick Deckard a mohawk and beat it up his coat. And 
uh, but all the lighting, and he's going up the staircase with the gun, and and and, and something from uh, uh, there was another one from uh, uh, Clockwork Orange. Um, so, yeah. but but the thing was, I looked at him and I went, "Oh my God, those are fucking amazing," you know. And I have this is where the bar is. Did you figure this out, or did somebody tell you? I, you you're you know, you're you're one of the most incredibly observant people with the most elephantine memory <laughs> I've ever met. So how do you? Um, so would do when you saw these these works of art? Did you figure that out? You put that together in your own head? Did Alex tell you? No, how I did that work? I didn't know Alex. Um, the the FASA, where where the company that did this game was, they had a stable of staff of artists. They had like four guys. So I knew those guys, and I hung out with those guys when I'd go up to get work from them. Right. Um, so they kind of said, they, when, I, when I saw this stuff the first time, it was in their offices. Right. And so, yeah, he does it on Duo Shade Board. I'm like, Duo Shade Board? Is that what uh, Mark Nelson did at Aliens? Like, yeah, yeah. And I go, yeah, I remember John Severn used to use that, use that on, you know. And I said, I got to do my stuff on that Duo Shade on that stuff. And they're, they're like, yeah. And, and they showed me how to get it. And uh, But no, I, I knew they were swipes from those movies, of course. I mean, that, that was, you know, easy. So you just recognize the swipes. You're like, oh my God, this, that's a card from Blade Runner. But I couldn't, I, I, but I couldn't deny how powerful the work was at the same time. So no, I, I think it's fascinating. I, a lot of guys, would, I mean, would never know it. I mean, I would. No, I, yeah. I would probably Johnny look at the, it, and I'd never know that Johnny on the street wouldn't have probably picked it up. That, right. you, that these were swipes. So that's the observant. That's the way an artists see something that we that we don't see. You know, um, that you can pick out. <laughs> <laughs> lobby cards and even though everything's been changed around so that was an amazing that was like a revelation for you yeah and I, I you know when I, my first job as a professional like working in games was I, I did this game called Twilight 2000 and that was like pencil illustrations over the way I was I took it over from a guy who basically taught me what his process was and then I took over for him so he could paint the covers and so it was, you take a piece of vellum and you lay it over, uh, you know, you find, you get a bunch of Vietnam books and, you know, soldier fortune books and you find cool pictures and then you trace them. But you basically render them. You're doing, you're, you're like, you're redrawing that whole photo in pencil or you're taking apart from this one and then you're, you're, you're taking apart from that one and you're putting it together and oh, I need a background and so I'll, then I move it to this one and then I draw the background. You know, it's laborious and painstaking as hell. Sure. But it taught me a lot, and it taught me how to work with photos. Right. So I thought when I saw Alex's stuff, I went, "Well, I know how to work from photos," and I kind of had been gravitating to that a little bit anyway in my own work. Yeah. Because I, I was never, I always thought more cinematically, and I always thought more more realistically. Right. And, I, and even though I loved the sketchiness and the and the stylization of the stuff that I was doing, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And so it wasn't until I started messing around with photos a little bit that I thought that I was like, this is what I like to do. When I saw Alex's stuff, it was just that next piece I needed. Right. And so, like I said, it set a bar, and I said, I have to equal that bar somehow. So I'm going to go back to photo ref, and I'm going to do my stuff like that. But, <clears throat> but I put a spin on it. I mean, I, I used, yeah, I swiped some stuff from National Geographic and stuff from this and stuff from that. I said, not a shoot pictures myself, so I swipe stuff from different places, but I hit it really well. Mm -hmm. All good artists do. But the fun thing, the, good, the best, the best <laughs> yeah. thing that ever happened to me, and that game took off, by the way, the stuff that I did for that was like, that, that really shot me up in the stratosphere um, of the game industry. So the game was a hit and... Huge. And you became a commodity yeah. in, that, in that world? Yeah. That's cool. And but, but you're still moonlighting as comic guy. Still trying to get into comics. Right. This is all aiming so, at trying to take the next step. So this uh, sequential piece that Tim Truman uh, got you, um, is this the first time that you went out and cast your actors and created costumes for them and shot them? No, yeah, for Age of Desire, for the Clive Barker thing. Yeah. So this is the first time that you've no. worked in this way that you did? I've done it singly before, for Shadowrun and for all these other games. When I started Shadowrun, that's when, the thing that happened was I took my stuff in one day, and the guys at FASA, man, beautiful stuff. This is beautiful. Oh, that's from National Geographic. I'm like, <laughs> they know. <laughs> I must teach myself photography. <laughs> so I got together with a buddy of mine named Kevin, who was a photographer, and he showed me how to shoot pictures, and he showed me how to develop pictures. 
I had got a dark room in my basement. I learned how to do all that shit. I had a wow. huge enlarger, a Pentax K1000, and wow. a bunch of T Max Kodak film. And yeah, I shot all my own stuff. So I did that for like a year and a half or two, where I was just like switched. I was doing photos. I had my friends come over. I I do them up. I make the costumes and I create. <laughs> and uh, and so. I, was, I knew what I was doing by the time I knew kind of what I was doing. I, did, I didn't have a dark room yet by the time I got Age of Desire, but I knew how finally to shoot my own stuff. So Age of Desire happened very slowly, not like a real professional, because I was having to find dark rooms to use and find people to be these people and find locations to shoot them in. Amazing. Times 48 pages. I mean, it was just huge. And you're not paying these. There's just friends that you have that you're yeah. like, I need you don't to Don't pay model anybody. For me. Everybody's just coming over to do it for fun. Right. And uh, and I'm making $175 a page for pencils and inks on a Clive Barker book in a time when comics were actually doing really good numbers. I mean, it was they were paying me nothing. Um, and and they actually paid me nothing because I only ever got like I think maybe I think I only ever made like about $1200 off that job, which is about 10, you know, like not even 10 pages worth of work. Oh, you didn't finish the job? I finished the job. I did the whole thing. I was waiting on checks. They, well, I never turned into like the last like 10 pages because I was waiting for them to pay me for the last 30 pages. And they never paid you? They never paid me. Oh, and, uh, and, while, and while I was waiting, while I was waiting to send them my last 10 pages and get a check, they went chapter 11. Oh. And they, I didn't see my pages for seven years. I, th we, I thought they were gone. Yeah. So I just spent six months of my life pouring my heart and soul and, and it was a learning process. I mean, yeah. this, you know, to do this Clive Barker book, I just spent like all this time, I, pneumonia during the thing and, and Dean Mullaney tried to fire me, you know, thought I was fucking, I was almost dead and he thought I was just flaking out. Yeah. <laughs> my mom gave him an earful. <clears throat> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, I went through four editors. Uh, uh, anyway, it was just, it was traumatic, man. My pages were gone. Um, all this time I'd spent was wasted. I never got paid. Um, the last thing I wanted to do was jump on another sequential book. And maybe I should have been the opposite. Maybe I would have said, I'm, I'm not going to let that daunt me. I'm going to jump right in and I'm going to attack something else. Uh, P. Craig Russell called me and he wanted me to do Slaughterhouse Five. He goes, dude, look, I love the way that happened. I love the way it looked. Let's do the same thing. I'll adapt it. I'll do all the breakdowns. I'll do this. We'll do this thing for Byron Price. He wants me to do an adaptation of Slaughterhouse Five. I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. You think you think Age of Desire was big? Yeah. I mean, it, I didn't know what I was saying. Luckily, Byron Price was a bit of a shit. Bless him, he's gone now. But he was a, he was a sly devil, and we agreed on a rate. And I started to work on the book. And when I turned in my, I, I did like a couple pages and um, I turned in a voucher and he calls me and he said, what, what hold on, what, what's this about uh, $225? I said, well, that's the rate we agreed on. He goes, no, 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 we agreed on 150. Yeah. I said, no, Byron, these, these I wouldn't have done the job for 150. Changed. Nothing's changed. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I told him to go stick it and I, never, and I just quit. Um, so that, that basically really, really was, it was traumatizing to me. I, I didn't want to do sequential. I just wanted to do single, single illustration is my favorite thing to do anyway. So that's how Tell that a story kind of, in one picture. That kind of kicked you back into doing single illustration. And inking other artists because I love that too yeah. because that, that, that jam, that creative jam between two minds trying to kind of create a single vision is, is something that really appeals to me. Right, right, right. I think guys like Chris Warner and Truman and Graham Nolan and... So how did you f run into those pages again? You thought those pages from the Eclipse thing were totally dead. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I was, I was sitting in my studio one afternoon. I got a call from Val Jones, who was, who was... She was one of the big editors at Pacific Comics when you were reading a lot of Pacific... When we were both reading a lot of Pacific Comics, like Alien Worlds. Oh, and yeah, Val Jones. She was one of my editors on Age of Desire. And, and now when... Eclipse went chapter 11, um, a lot of stuff went in storage, a lot of stuff was destroyed, but the stuff that went in storage was eventually purchased by Todd McFarlane. Mm -hmm. Because Bo Smith, who was the sales manager for Eclipse, 
he went to work for Todd after Eclipse went under. And so, he, so Bo helped make that deal happen so that, that Eclipse stuff didn't rot somewhere. Right. Todd McFarlane bought it and he had all these properties. Right. Miracle Man, all these great properties yeah. that Eclipse had. And uh, I called Bo and I said, Bo, is there any way you can get somebody to go through that stuff and see if they can find my pages and this? And uh, Bo really worked very hard to try to find my stuff. Uh, but he never could dig them up. And then just one day out of the blue, Val calls me up. You know, I got this box shipped to me from Eclipse like two years ago. And I, I just kind of set it in a, in a corner. I didn't know what it was. I just kind of set it in a corner. I just forgot about it. Well, I was going through stuff today, and I opened it up, and lo and behold, there's your pages. And I'm like, holy shit, really? You know? And it was, it was really eye-opening when I got those pages back. I was like, you know, open up the box. I was all excited. I'm looking at them going, God, I sucked then. You know, it was like, <laughs> I've come a long later? way in seven years. Yeah. Seven years? Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was almost eight years. So, but it was, it was weird. It was like, I missed them terribly. It was like having, it was like finding my, chil my children. But, you know, like after your ch child is abducted and then you, you find them seven years later, well, you missed three, four, five, six. Now I got a, a, a 10 year old who doesn't know me. You know, it's, it's bittersweet, right? That's what finding those pages was for me. So you completed that, you did 30 pages of that job? 48, four, actually about 52 pages. You completed the job? Yeah, I, I, I'd finished the whole where, job. Where is, the, uh, where is that now? Did anyone ever put it out? It, it took about five years after we got the stuff back to find a deal um, that we liked. Right. <laughs> Which, anyway, it got put out um, by Joe Pruitt. At Desperado. At Desperado. He put it out. And, and, un, and the unfortunate thing about that is that it, originally it was supposed to be this, you know, kind of big graphic novel, you know, beautiful book, hardcover, and it had this great cover and all that. And it ended up having a nice package, but it was black and white, and it was like this big because that was what they could afford. And these guys have a panel, so no, thanks. No, no, no. But you, no. Guys keep going. no, no I'm only on for 45. Oh, no. I just keep telling what you guys got to say. <laughs> Mr. Mephistopheles shows up. It's not your time yet. Yes, we're eight minutes over. No, no, that, you got you to get a shot of these, these guys standing in front. Of you. <laughs> Is it question? <coughs> yeah, yeah, well, there's time to No, you. no. They, yeah, you mean, do you have a panel. question? I, th I think I might. Um, why are you two so sexy? I mean, how, how, does that, how does that happen? Hey, how do you say sexy like by the way, I'm going to avoid that question really quick. And I just I want to acknowledge that guy. These Both these guys. Uh, Jimmy was the guy who had the brilliant idea to say, Tim, will you do the Punisher for us at for Marvel? Cheap. For, <laughs> for cheaper. It was enough. It was enough. <laughs> for what we could afford. And Steve and I have known each other forever yeah. since the Eclipse days, with the Eclipse yeah. days, which we just talked about. Um, and, but I've never and, quite seen you like this. this is, anyway, this is a new side of Steve. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, they're real. They're real. Yeah. Tell in the eye, the eye, the eyes. Come on, the old couple. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I ran into an old couple last night in the dark, and they stopped cold. And I, all I said was, I haven't come for you. <laughs> <laughs> I just started laughing. And I told you you should have said, but I know what you did. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk later. I have to go for you. So we, we are kind of done. We're supposed to wrap at uh, 1245, and we need to get back to our table. But Anybody have one question? Anybody, you know, and you can, you can ask questions at my table, too, if, you, if there yeah. was stuff you wanted to ask. How did you guys meet? We covered that. that. Oh, you did? You've been through all that. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Bad Planet, yeah. Uh, Steve, Steve and Bernie and, and Steve and, and Tim and myself. I really, which I really love. And awesome. Because first of all, it's big. Yeah. It's in black and white, and it's or, it really it's like I don't you know color can be a distraction. Sometimes. I sure. I mean, sometimes you know, most of the times it works. Everything has to be a little it's wonderful. Yeah, if you really. But I really appreciate seeing the black and the white and, well, and just having it jump out. At We're the only ones doing it. Yeah. Well, it's not true, but but we love black and white. Uh, we are. We just we have artists that are really really slow. So 
just, you know, the books will come out, but we're not really sure. Is that book we available at your booth? Yes. Yeah. You're having <laughs> a booth. All right. Go down and check out. How much book. is it? How much is it? <laughs> uh, what is it? 30 bucks? 30 it's bucks. oversized, all right? It's wow. Black. See, it's that's a big black book. Did, did, you get, did you come over and get books yet? What? Did big. you come over and get books yet? Okay. Make sure we get you books before the show's over. Yeah. But then, what you were saying about the pencils, you like to work with such detail. That makes sense to me, but there should be, you know, this line that's devoted to the detail. You know, well, that, that, you know, Tom and I both wanted to do, we, we loved Absolutely. the black and white artwork from the book, um, and, and we wanted to do a black and white oversized version of that book, because it's like, it's like the EC stuff we love, and that was our inspiration for the book to begin with, was those old science fiction stories, and so to us, you know, we knew we were going to do a color trade, but we wanted to do something kind of stupid, <laughs> you know, and offer it. Because, I mean, you don't make a ton of money with that stuff. I mean, unfortunately, not, not everyone thinks like you do or like we do because um, there'd be a lot more really great black and white books out there right now if that was the case. And black and white books are a hell of a lot easier, a lot cheaper to, cheaper to put out. Um, and we could, we could all do some, you know, get out more projects if, we, if more people would buy that stuff, but it's not supported as much. Yeah, oh yeah. He's working with Talk Steve to right now. What booth are you guys at? To the cover. He's the cover. What booth are you guys at? Do you know the number? We're in the 1900s. The 1900s. Go down. He has got all the black and white books down there. Yeah, they've got. What's the new book at IDW? Is uh, the monster? It's monsters collection. Monsters it's collection. Black Big hardcover, black and white, just the kind of stuff you love. Yeah. Writes in the Niles. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Um, uh, let's uh, give it up for Tim Bradstreet. Thank you for coming out. Time to give the devil his Steve Niles, Jimmy Palmiotti. Right. The devil and the guy. Yeah. The devil. And the other